Well, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, right now, Koshin is getting the camera tuned in for the presentation. And uh, hopefully, it is July 12th. Um, so the topic for tonight is the Sutra of Innumerable Meanings. And there are a couple of reasons I picked this sutra. One of them is uh, it's relatively short, so we can talk a little more readily about the content of it, even though we'll only be looking at one of the three chapters. But also, it's a sutra that I personally enjoy. And also, it's answering a very interesting question, which is, uh, what is the most effective way to achieve supreme perfect awakening? So if you want to be on the fast track, tonight is your night. <laughs> Next slide, please. So just a little bit of uh, information about the sutra. So this sutra is uh, often understood to take place immediately before the Lotus Sutra. And one of the reasons for this is that the introduction to the Lotus Sutra, it's mentioned that Shakyamuni Buddha enters the samadhi of innumerable meanings. And so then later this sutra was written and people said, ah, that's what it was talking about. Uh, so it sort of fills in um, this kind of gap uh, before the main content of the Lotus Sutra, but also it sort of serves as a Cliff Notes version of the Lotus Sutra, or sort of a distillation of the ideas of at least the first half of the Sutra, but I think based on what we talk about tonight, you know, you might be able to see sort of the whole Sutra in there. So I kind of already hinted at this, but uh, why are we interested in this in the first place? And I'm particularly interested in this because the sutra is about the, the most effective or the quickest way to achieve supreme perfect awakening. So in general, this sutra follows a sort of standard structure that we see in many Mahayana sutras of having an introduction in which many figures are present, uh, all kinds of gods, heavenly musicians, bodhisattvas, all of the your favorite famous disciples of the Buddha are there, of course. Um, and there's a sort of long introduction where a bodhisattva named Great Adornment, as well as 84,000 other bodhisattvas, circumambulate the Buddha and make a series of offerings to him and then recite a bunch of verses in unison, which must be an amazing sound. Um, and basically, the main content of the first chapter is them reciting the sort of 32 major marks of the Buddha and talking about how uh, actually his body doesn't really have marks because he is empty. But at the same time, they're seeing the marks and they're paying tribute to them. So at this point, uh, we're kind of set up. We have the locale and there are a lot of people there. And um, on to the next slide, please. The Bodhisattva Great Adornment and the others uh, ask a question. They want to know, uh, well, I'll read the question from the text. Well, honored one. For the Bodhisattva Mahasattvas to quickly accomplish supreme perfect awakening, what approaches to the Dharma should they practice? Which approaches to the Dharma allow Bodhisattva Mahasattvas to accomplish supreme perfect awakening quickly? And the initial answer that Shakyamuni Buddha gives um, is there's one approach to the Dharma that enables Bodhisattvas to accomplish supreme perfect awakening quickly, and if Bodhisattvas learn this approach to the Dharma, then they will attain supreme perfect awakening quickly. Well, great Dharma's interested. He wants to know. Uh, what's it? What's the approach called? What is the teaching, and how do we practice it? So to answer those questions, the first thing is what is the approach called, and the answer is obviously innumerable meanings, since that's the name of the sutra. So the second two questions, I think we can actually sort of combine. Um, what the teaching is is also how you practice the teaching. The two are sort of combined; they're not really separated out in the answers. So. To begin answering this question, uh, Shakyamuni Buddha really just jumps in. He says, uh, at every point in time, all things themselves are tranquil and empty in nature and attributes. So what I've kind of done is I've taken what comes in a series of paragraphs as sort of a narrative answer and tried to, tried to break it up where we can kind of understand what the different steps are. So the first one is, he identifies that bodhisattvas uh, sort of see the emptiness of the nature of things. And so uh, I kind of included this table on the side just so that it's easier for us to keep track of, that the emptiness of nature is oriented toward the sort of internal characteristics of things, where the emptiness of attributes is sort of the external uh, attributes of things, like how they appear, those sorts of things. And then the nature is kind of that thing that we hold on to, like, you know, uh, I'm a jealous person, or, oh, I'm a very joyful and kind person. I'm an empath, you know, those sorts of things. 
Uh, and the third category is like empty space, which I put not applicable because it, the idea here is that like empty space is, um, we're talking about transcending duality. So the categories of internal and external are no longer really present at that level of emptiness. So the emptiness of nature is sort of the conclusion of dependent origination with respect to the natures of things. When we examine our own natures, we can notice change from moment to moment and year to year throughout our lives. And, you know, an example of this would be seeing someone that you knew when you were growing up and uh, now you see them and they are parents to children. And it seems like the, the nature of that person has somewhat changed by their life circumstances. Uh, the emptiness of attributes, we could say, is sort of the conclusion of dependent origination with respect to the appearance of appearances of things to the senses. So in Buddhism, this means the five senses that we would normally think about, as well as the sense of the mind, which means the way that we conceptualize and think about things. And the qualities of these objects all come from elsewhere, whether we're speaking of the arising of a quality, the continuity of those qualities, or the relativity of qualities. So one example we could think of for the emptiness of attributes is the sort of relativity of how we understand the um, appearance to our senses of different things. So for instance, we could say, um, we don't really understand what it means for something to be hot without having the counterpoint of something being cold or up uh, in relationship to down, those sorts of ideas that are all based on duality. So the third category in, in the text, it just says uh, that these things are non-dual, they're just like empty space. This is the emptiness of the emptiness of nature and the emptiness of the emptiness of attributes as a way to transcend that duality. This is like paragraph one of his answer. <laughs> then the Buddha continues though, and this is where things get sort of interesting. Uh, he goes straight into, uh, after talking about this sort of nature of emptiness, he says, all living beings, however, make false and arbitrary assessments. They suppose that this is one thing and that is another thing, or this is a gain, but that is a loss. Giving rise to such unwholesome ideas and creating all sorts of bad karma, they transmigrate in the six realms of existence, unable to free themselves. There they receive much suffering and pain for immeasurable millions of kalpas. And another way to state this is that by seeing that our circumstances and the circumstances of everyone else are constantly changing, and that our resistance to this change leads time and again to everything between mild inconvenience and large-scale tragedy, we feel an inclination to do something about it, to use that insight that uh, many, if not all, of our catastrophes are avoidable, at least to some degree. So, perceiving this clearly, bodhisattva mahasattvas are sort of moved to heartfelt sympathy, to giving rise to great compassion, and they want to relieve the suffering of living beings. And this is actually what causes them to, in Shakyamuni Buddha's words, profoundly fathom all things. Which is sort of interesting because from the beginning of this sutra, we were sort of talking a little bit about emptiness, but really what's giving these bodhisattvas their wisdom is actually their compassion. It's the concern they have for other people that's the source of their wisdom initially. And next slide, please. So, at this point, they observe, quoting from the text, how attributes of things such as these give rise to things such as those, how attributes of things such as these stabilize things such as those, how attributes of things such as these change things such as those, and how attributes of things such as these extinguish things such as those. And also, they they also observe how attributes of things such as these can give rise to unwholesome things and how attributes of things such as these can give rise to, un uh, to wholesome things. And so is it also with stabilizing, changing, and extinguishing as well. And so these four taken together in the text are referred to as the four phases of change, which uh, are starting with arising, stabilizing, changing, and extinguishing. So let's focus uh, on the left hand of the screen for a minute, and we'll get to the right hand of the screen. So bodhisattvas, having thus investigated and completely under understood these four, these four phases from beginning to end, next observe that all things are never at rest for even a moment, arising anew and being extinguished in each moment, and further observe that they are instantaneously arising, stabilizing, changing, and being extinguished. So on the left-hand side of this, we sort of see this process arrow, right? And things kind of to our 
perception begin with some sort of arising. They come into being and they have some persistence for an amount of time. And then they go through a change over the course of that persistence and then eventually they go away. And that's sort of our normal idea of a causal process. But what Shakyamuni Buddha is saying is that if we actually spend time investigating this claim and really, really trying to get acquainted with these four phases of change, we're actually going to realize that those four stages are instantaneously happening all the time, which this picture on the right is an attempt at sort of showing one way that we can maybe try to visualize this idea. So we have sort of the arrow of time, and then you have basically this process, and you have a bunch of discrete moments going in a row. And at each moment, all four stages are happening. So to think about this statement, we, this statement doesn't really need to be a rigid adherence to a linear conception of time, but what we are being asked to do is at least imagine time as a set of discrete moments. So in each moment, all four phases are happening simultaneously. There are some things that are arising, some that are stabilizing, some that are changing, and some that are being extinguished. And we can see in a collection of moments, the lifespan of a person, situation, or an idea, but in each individual moment, we see spontaneous creation, destruction, stability, and, transient, uh, and transience. Each moment is actually all four. Next slide, please. So, after such an observation, the bodhisattvas fathom the faculties, natures, and desires of all living beings. As living beings' natures and desires are innumerable, so are the ways of teaching them the Dharma innumerable. And as the ways of teaching are innumerable, so are meanings innumerable. So to say that the natures and desires of living beings are innumerable is to acknowledge that the structure of reality is one of innumerable possibilities. The reason possibilities are innumerable is that the natures and attributes of things are constantly changing. We are situated as agents in a web of causation so vast that every moment has the potential to create large-scale change. Each moment holds the entire potential of Dharma by virtue of being one node of the web that constitutes the universe. And from this perspective, the injunction to liberate all sentient beings from suffering is the most reasonable conclusion. The harmony of the entire universe depends on the harmony expressed by all of us. The innumerable meanings arise from the one dharma, and this one dharma is namely the state of having no attributes. Again, going back to a notion of emptiness. There's no attribute anywhere that is not an attribute of such a state of having no attributes. <laughs> Meaning that even emptiness itself is also empty. There's nothing that sort of escapes this, uh, this quality of being composed of everything except for itself, if that sort of makes sense. There is no center. Everything is defined relatively by everything else. Um, sorry, I jumped out of the quote, so now I'm lost. Um, Yeah, there is no attribute anywhere that is not an attribute of having such a state of no attributes, as it takes not even attributelessness as its attribute. I know that's <laughs> Therefore, it is called the ultimate reality of attributes. And this statement returns us to the starting point of the process and closes the circle. Emptiness is the beginning and the end. Our initial encounter with emptiness led us through a process of realizing the limitless potential of emptiness and back to resting in its tranquility. The one dharma is like a light shine through a prism or reflected from a disco ball, if you prefer, when processed by our minds in its various potential aspects. Because it's the state of having no attributes, it is also the state of being able to take on any attributes without holding on to or requiring any of them. Well, this is kind of the transition really to the third, the third question, which was how do bodhisattvas actually practice this? It's probably a question you're all wondering too. <laughs> Abiding steadfastly in this truly ultimate reality, Bodhisattva Mahasattvas demonstrate compassion that is clearly true and not in vain. They are truly able to remove sufferings wherever living beings are. After having removed the sufferings of living beings, they again teach them the Dharma, giving them relief and joy. Of great interest is the statement that the compassion demonstrated by Bodhisattvas is, as the text says, true and not in vain. Though we acknowledge that there is a difference between sincere compassion and performative compassion, we acknowledge this pretty readily when you say that people seem kind of fake or those sorts of things, we should read this as being probably the sincerest possible display of compassion. 
This compassion is true because it is rooted in the structure of our reality itself. Compassion is the default position of the universe we inhabit, but we usually don't acknowledge this fact. All the beings of the universe are in their situations together. And as observed earlier, the Bodhisattva has the experience of seeing how all of these beings are missing the big picture. We are too busy running around on little hamster wheels of suffering to understand that every moment of life is an expression of generosity. The air we breathe, the earth we live on, the water that composes our bodies, all of these things are borrowed. We borrow them from each other, and they belong to no one. They're constantly given and received with no thought of giver, gift, or the receiver of that gift. How could this realization not be shared with others? Who would not give others this relief and joy? Good children, bodhisattvas capable of thus practicing this one approach to the Dharma, innumerable meanings, will without fail be able to accomplish supreme perfect awakening quickly. Well, this is it. Supreme perfect awakening is apparently a group project. The fastest way to achieve it is for all of us to work as a team. And the way to do that is to stop putting my concerns first and start putting our concerns first. And our concerns are, well, unfortunately, innumerable. This is the conclusion that we're having now. Uh, next slide, please. Well, so this brings us to the next question. The Bodhisattva Great Adornment and these 84,000 other Bodhisattvas ask, what's the difference between the meanings of all the things you taught in the past and what you're teaching now? And why do you declare that a Bodhisattva who practices the extremely profound and supreme great vehicle of innumerable meanings is certain to attain the highest awakening quickly? Please, world honored one, out of compassion for all living beings, Thoroughly clarify this matter so that everyone who hears the Dharma in the present and the future will be completely free from a web of doubts. The Buddha begins by recounting the story of his six years of practice and his eventual achievement of Supreme Perfect Awakening under the Bodhi tree. And he says that telling everyone of my perception of all things seen with the Buddha eye was not possible, which is a story that we're probably familiar with. So one of the issues here is that the Buddha's awakening, as he describes it here, it's, is an experience. And thus, when he tries to explain it, what he's trying to do is explain something that he perceived and physically experienced. The ability to do this is severely limited by no common core of experience, which is a common issue between speakers and their audience. So among living beings, we don't really have a good common language to be able to speak to each other about these kinds of things. Cultural and linguistic barriers aside, each of us have individual experiences that form our understanding of, understandings of ourselves and the world. Shakyamuni Buddha could not explain his awakening even to the five ascetics that he had practiced with for years, much less a total stranger who was not a religious adept. So, the Buddha does the next best thing. He teaches the Dharma according to the different natures and desires, as he puts it, of living beings. In other words, he uses skillful means not to describe the experience of awakening, but to lead others to experience awakening directly. But because the truth has never been revealed in its entirety, uh, quoting from the Sutra, living beings attain the way differently and cannot quickly attain the highest awakening. Uh, next slide, please. So now we get into an interesting section that is very enjoyable in this text. He just Cold goes into what is the Dharma. He just starts telling you what this notion of capital D Dharma is. And what he says is, the Dharma is like water that can wash away dirt and grime, whether from a well, a pond, a stream, a river, a brook, a canal, or an ocean, water can wash away all sorts of dirt and grime. This is also the case with the water of the Dharma, which can wash away the dirt of all living beings' defilements. And I think we should really investigate this metaphor to understand the sutra's vision of, of capital D Dharma. So we can imagine the difference between using running water to wash your hands if they're dirty versus washing them in a puddle, for instance. But what about a kitchen sink compared to a shower or using a washing machine to clean something? While all of these are different ways that water can be used to clean an object, the way the water is directed at the object affects how clean the object gets, the speed at which it's cleaned, etc. We could, for instance, imagine using a garden hose and putting our finger over the end of the hose to speed up the flow of the water when we're trying to clean thick mud off of something, like gardening tools. And in this case, uh, by this analogy, our finger would sort of be the skillful means directing the flow of the Dharma in a way that helps eliminate the defilements that are on our gardening tool. 
But also this water of the Dharma is one in nature, but at the same time, a stream, a river, a well, a pond, a brook, a canal, and an ocean are all different from one another. The Dharma nature is also like this. Although it washes away the dirt of defilements equally and indiscriminately, the various teachings and the results that come from practicing them are not necessarily the same. So again, returning to the example above, we're always using water for cleaning, regardless of how we're directing it, where it's coming from, etc. And the water we're using is still part of the water existing on our planet that originated from elsewhere in the universe. And this is merely one mode of water that's present throughout the universe. But obviously, the puddle is not as effective as using the garden hose or the washing machine for your clothes, etc. Though each source of water washes away dirt, a well is not a pond, a pond is not a stream or river, and a brook or a canal is not the ocean. And this statement is likened to the Buddhist teaching in various time periods. The discourses of his early, middle, and later period are all able to cleanse living beings of their defilements, and yet the early discourses are not the middle ones, and the middle ones are not the later ones. Ah, uh, we're getting close to the answer to the question. And most importantly, his early, middle, and later discourses, as it puts, as it's put in the text by Shakyamuni Buddha, use the exact same words, and yet their meanings are different. So he goes on to explain that actually the audience is what determines the meaning of the words, even though he's using the same words in every case. The sutra goes through a little uh, series of these. At the Deer Park in Varanasi, the Buddha taught the Four Noble Truths and, quote, he taught that inherently all things are tranquil and empty, constantly regenerating and never abiding, and produced and extinguished in every moment. Sounds familiar. In fact, in the middle period, he taught the Twelve Causes and Six Paramitas, and that inherently all things are tranquil and empty, constantly regenerating and never abiding, and produced and extinguished in every moment. Slide, please. And also now, by teaching the Sutra of Innumerable Meanings, he is once again teaching that inherently all things are tranquil and empty, constantly regenerating and never abiding, and produced and extinguished in every moment. In each of these periods, the Buddha intended to teach a small group of people, and yet he noticed his audience growing larger and larger. Whenever he taught using skillful means, he always saw in some members of the audience an aspiration to a greater awakening, while some chose to stay where they were at. And this leads him to say that even though the discourse is the same, its meaning will vary. Next slide, please. So, you can just relax now. I'm basically going to read the this conclusion, and you'll see why the image is uh, here. But the text continues, Since I attained the way, and set out to teach the Dharma for the first time, until I revealed the great vehicle sutra of innumerable meanings today, I have never ceased explaining suffering, emptiness, transience, and non-self. I've expounded that all things are neither true nor provisional, neither large nor small, and neither produced in the first place nor subsequently perishing, that they have the one attribute and are the absence of attributes, and that they have Dharma nature and Dharma attributes, that they are neither coming nor going, and that even so for living beings, the four phases of change continue. All the Buddha's words are one, not two. With one voice, they can respond to the various voices of beings everywhere. Their one body can be manifested as hundreds of thousands of millions of myriads of bodies, infinite and innumerable as the sands of the Ganges. Each of these bodies can be further manifested as hundreds of thousands of millions of myriads of forms, innumerable as the sands of the Ganges. Moreover, each of these forms can also be manifested as hundreds of thousands of millions of myriads of forms, innumerable as the sands of the Ganges. Good children, such is the inconceivable and extremely profound realm of Buddhas. It cannot be understood by the two vehicles, and it is even beyond the reach of bodhisattvas of the tenth stage, which is the highest stage bodhisattvas reach. <clears throat> Only a Buddha together with a Buddha can fathom it. Therefore, good children, I say that the sublime, extremely profound, and supreme great vehicle sutra of innumerable meanings is unsurpassed in the eloquence of its expression and the truth of its principles. It is guarded and protected by the Buddhas of the past, present, and future. It is impervious to the hordes of Mars or to outside teachings. It cannot be defeated by any distorted views or destroyed by birth and death. And then 
this chapter ends with uh, all of the people in, at in attendance um, spontaneously know many Durrani, which are sort of the incantations that are used for protection and things like this. And they sort of have this deep insight into the nature of reality, and many people resolve that they now want to be bodhisattvas instead of being shravakas or prateka buddhas, etc. And this kind of brings chapter two to a close. And what's interesting is the sutra actually continues with chapter three, and chapter three is a long exposition of the merits of people who learn this teaching of innumerable meanings. And uh, it would be kind of fun, maybe, at least for me, to spend a discussion session actually talking about just that third chapter, because it's actually a pretty meaty chapter, and one of the major parts of it that makes it so interesting is that it encourages people who are very early in the stages of bodhisattva practice to basically confidently go out and start trying to liberate sentient beings and exercising their practice of skillful means, which you don't see in a lot of places. Usually they say, please, like, spend many, many lifetimes and really have this down before you go out and start talking to people. Uh, next slide, please. So there are a few conclusions just from looking at this particular text. Um, one is that the sutra relies heavily on familiarity with Buddhist teachings outside of the text. Uh, I gave you more explanation of emptiness than the text gave. It really just said emptiness of nature's attributes, uh, non-dual like empty space, and that was, uh, that was enough explanation for the audience. Um, so aside from really explaining the four phases of change, the sutra is mostly a meta discourse on how we should contextualize Buddhist teachings and how they should restructure our view of reality. And what's particularly important and interesting about this text, I think, is the perspective that it offers. So one thing to notice is the equal importance of wisdom and compassion are evident in the description of the bodhisattva process, as I've decided to call it. Um, a small amount of wisdom initially, this insight into emptiness at its barest level, uh, leads the bodhisattva immediately to a feeling of compassion. They immediately apply it to looking at what other people are doing and what their quality of life is like. And uh, it's really that step of caring about others that leads them to the deeper wisdom that then allows them to really examine the, the four phases of change, which then feeds back into a more compassionate attitude, which then brings us back to an even deeper understanding of, of emptiness. The cycle kind of keeps going with wisdom and compassion being sort of the step that gets you to the next part of this process in an endless cycle. Additionally, if we examine uh, what it means for things to be constantly changing and devoid of static, unchanging selves, the phenomena we experience take on a sort of boundless, fractal structure in which all things are recognizable only in their relationships to everything else. And this is sort of the ultimate opportunity for harmony, in my mind, in which uh, reality itself can sort of move toward a form of dynamic balance. And then uh, one of my major takeaways from this particular text is uh, I think it sort of makes the argument that actually uh, mindfulness is sort of the ultimate Buddhist practice. And um, I think you know, mindfulness is often understood to mean something along the lines of be here now or these kind of slogans that we hear, um, paying extreme attention or those kinds of things, not being on your smartphone, etc. cetera. Um, but the reality is that uh, basically all of those things that are kind of understood to not be being here now are actually happening here and now. Uh, we are here now. In fact, you don't really have a choice in that, which hence the central problem of Buddhism, what to do about dukkha. The question is not so much where and when we are, but it's how we are. And uh, this kind of leads me to a series of questions, right, that I think are at the core of the form of mindfulness that this teaching is leading us to, which is saying, you know, in each moment, the smallest unit of time you can possibly have in each moment, are we observing the four phases of change as both sequential and spontaneous? Are we waking each other up over and over again, every day from moment to moment? How is our effort directed from one moment to the next? Are we creating more confusion and chaos or acting as some sort of stable center, a place of refuge that can be realized by everyone else from one moment to the next? Next slide, please. Um, I was somehow able to find an underwater elephant who shot from underwater, so that's what we got tonight. Um, I'd like to open it up for questions, comments, and thoughts, but first, um, is Hichishima Sensei online? Good question. 
I want to open it up to uh, both of the senseis for comments first. Okay. I don't see it to show you since I'm not there. Yeah, I'm like, I'm missing it. You got that. Um, the only the only comment I have is that this is <clears throat> we have a couple we have a number of people here who are relatively beginners. You're know, using some terminology which they may may not be yes. um, aware of. <laughs> so um, keep in mind that that some of the terminology which is used is I'm not going to go through it. We're not going to provide a bibliography or a glossary, but Keep in mind that as you begin to study more and more, the terminology becomes uh, apparent, and we don't have to define it uh, over and over again. And I just wanted to make that point from the very beginning. So if people think I'm completely lost because I don't know what the terminology is, yeah, I understand that. <laughs> and, um, on the other hand, it, uh, Kaiden was beginning you know, at a level that was above the beginning level, just, just be aware of that. So we're just going to open it up to some questions. Any question is a good question. But we're going to stop. We're going to stop.